Hey guys, Alamine here. It's uh, It's been quite a while since I did a video. So I'm going to go ahead and do the video on the store step. Um, originally I said this is going to be a pretty deep video. But uh, I decided that I was going to give AGUs their entire own episode as they're pretty complicated. So it probably won't be that hard of a uh, episode. <coughs> so. In my last video, which was a while ago, I said that the ALU does a calculation, and uh, let's say you get something, you give it, you give the ALU, or it does not necessarily the ALU, just an execution unit. Let's say you give the ALU an instruction that's 1 plus 1, which may actually just be B plus 1, which, you know, still ends up being 1. Now, let's say the instruction says to store this value into d it's going to be b plus 1 equals d so 1 plus 1 equals 2 equals d so now d equals 2 that's basically what we got from this from this whole calculation is d equals 2 where that kind of looks bad actually like that so I'm going to put this here d equals oh sorry 2 equals d that's uh this that's basically the only thing that everything's gonna be dealt with in the star step. The um the result, which is two equals D. So what happens once the ELU gets the result two equals D? Well it'll go to a place called a register. Let's just say reg for register int 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 reg. It'll be in the integer register because that's what the ELU works with directly. <coughs> And then the scheduler is either the unified scheduler in the case of Intel or the split schedulers in the case of AMD will be notified that it is done, that the instruction is done, the result is there, D equals 2. You know, or sorry, 2 equals Z. I don't know why I keep getting that mixed up. And it'll go to the AGU and it'll be passed off. So what happens now is this is an integer instruction. So the unified scheduler will take this, no problem. It'll take this and throw it over to the AGU. And, uh, you know, there'll be no issues. Now, in some cases, AMD has it split up in a little bit more of a separate way. <laughs> AMD has a floating point, uh, a fl floating point scheduler and an integer scheduler, but the AGUs are only on the integer scheduler. So the floating point scheduler has to take it from, has to take the result and then transfer over to the integer scheduler and then into the AGU. So it's a little bit more of a, uh, you know, it's, it's an extra step. But, but it's not necessarily a difficult step. Or it doesn't really even consume any clock rates. It's just an extra thing to consider. So, I mean, it doesn't really reduce speed. It's just an extra thing to consider. And um, it does necessitate that both schedulers are on, which does use a little more power. Nonetheless, on track. Um, once the result went through the scheduler and into the AGU, it's now the AGU's job completely. Once, once the result is to the AGU, the, this entire portion here can be completely blocked off, ignored. So what the AGU does is D it usually isn't just given as D. D may be given as, let's say, um, A26 plus 3 times 4 or something like that. And then the AGU will take that. <coughs> It'll convert this and say um, that is... A26 plus 12, and then the address is now A38. <coughs> now that, that right there, that whole calculation, is kind of probably just went right over your head, and that's okay. That's kind of the idea. It's supposed to go over your head. Th that kind of calculation will be discussed later when I, dis when I discuss AGUs and when I discuss the differences between virtual addresses and physical addresses. So, nonetheless... Uh, the G AGU will calculate an address for D, it'll take the 2, and then basically just put it in D. So where is D? That's what the, uh, that's what the translation looks side buffers are for, and that's what something in the AGU called the table walker is for. <laughs> so it'll say, where is D? Now, you know, logic would dictate that D either, if it's gonna be, if it's something that's going to be modified, if D already exists, existed, then D would have to be found. But if D was not already existing, then D would simply be created. In the case of something being found, then it would be like this, where you'd have to get up an old address, walk through all the, the, 
the cache is or even the RAM, find the address and then modify it. So let's say that it's in the L1 data cache. The AGU or the table walker would go through the L1 data translation local side buffer and it would say where in the L1 data cache is D or is there even D that I, or is there the D I'm looking for in this data cache? Yeah, it's right here and the AGU will then put it well then the AGU will then put that value into the L1 data cache. If it's just a if D didn't exist previously and it's just being created then a, then a new uh, then a new entry will automatically be made in the L1 data cache and the address will be much simpler than well actually it's already kind of simple so it might actually be that simple but usually it'll just be a uh, it'll be a table set a table column a table row and then an addition but not always. It's, it's kind of complicated, and that'll be discussed a little bit more when I discuss AGUs. <clears throat> so, the AGU, it takes the result and then stores it into the L1 data cache or anywhere else, wherever that uh, result needs to be put. What happens after that? How does... We, now we know where the where the result goes. We know the result goes into the data cache, but then where does it go from there? How does it get to your screen? Well, it, there's a number of ways. Either way, for it to get to your screen or your mouse or you know, or not your mouse is an input device, for it to get to your speakers or, you know, whatever, wherever, wherever. Uh, or to the RAM, even, because RAM would technically be an output device in this case. It has to go either to the RAM, if it's going to the RAM, if it's just a, uh, you know, if it's not something that needs to be passed off to the video processor or the sound processor, or even if the CPU is taking an emulation of the sound processor, then it would go directly to the RAM. In which case, it would be in, it would, something would happen called an eviction case. Now, I'm going to discuss evictions a little bit more when I talk about caches. But what eviction is, is basically the L1 data cache is smaller than the L2, and the L2 is smaller than the L3. So, the L1, there's actually a copy of the L1 in the L2, and there's actually a copy of the L2 in the L3. With there's a copy, so let's say there's 32 kilobytes of information here. That exact same 32 kilobytes will be in here, and that and let's say there this whole L2 cache is one megabyte. That entire one megabyte will be copied into here. So even though you may be saying, oh, you're wasting space by copying things, it's just how eviction works and how memory mapped input output works. <coughs> so let's say we have to store D into the RAM. It would go to the L1 data cache and it would stay there until that D wasn't used or there the D pass into the eviction clause and it would go to the L2 and then it would pass the eviction clause again it would go to the L3 and then the L3 eviction clause and then it would go to the RAM. What is an eviction clause? An eviction clause is basically saying it'll move a memory address back into a slower or a further part of the <coughs> of the memory hierarchy. So right at the top of the memory hierarchy we have the ALU or what's literally running through the ALU. Then we have the registers, then we have the L1 data cache, then the L2, then the L3, then the RAM, then the page file, then the hard disk. So it'll keep moving back and usually once it hit RAM it doesn't really go past that unless you run out of RAM. So eviction clause is basically a certain condition met that moves the data back. So if D wanted to get to RAM, it would go to the L1 data, then it would wait for the eviction clause, it would go to the L2, wait for the eviction clause, L3, eviction clause, RAM, and that's where it would ho its home would be. Or it may not or D may be so often, or maybe not even past the eviction clause, and it may just stay in the L1, in which case it would get very fast access, which is fine. Now, what if something had to get to your screen? Uh, it would have to go, to, or, you know, your screen, or an, another output device, or even to another processor such as video processor or a sound processor. It would have to go through something called a memory I.O. Or just in general an I.O. But the very most common kind of I.O. is a memory I.O. And I'll explain those a little bit later, possibly. Basically what an I.O. is, it's, it stands for input output. It is its own, um, it's its own, how do I explain this? It's its own handler for handling inputs and handling outputs. So there's many ways to have an I.O. You may be noticing there's a path here to get to the I.O. There's a path through the RAM to get to the I.O. There's a path after the L3 cache to get to the I.O. And this is just through all the architectures. You, in most architectures, you don't have all these paths. You either have through the RAM, uh, through the L3 cache, or even directly right after the AGU. 
So, uh, you know, IOs are a little bit more complicated, and I may possibly go into a little more detail about them later, but you don't really need to worry about them, as they don't actually really, aren't really part of CPU architecture. Once you go into the IO, you're past memory architecture. I mean, you're past CPU architecture. Actually, once you get into the RAM, you're past CPU architecture, so you don't really need to worry about that. All, the, the overview here is that basically, the ALU does a calculation, gets a result, that result gets passed to the unify to the schedulers, which passes to the AGU, which puts it into either wherever the modified directory needs to be, or be a new entry will be created in the data cache. And that's it. That's that's a store step. It's very simple. I said it was gonna be hard because I would have explained the AGU in this episode, but it's actually complicated enough to warrant its entire own episode, and that's what I'm gonna do for it. So it's very simple, just a couple steps or three steps, you know, result, or even not even result is really a step. That's kind of the end of the execution. So scheduler, AGU, and then store, final store. Now, it may be lengthened and chopped up in other architectures, or may even be compressed. And it's all up to the architecture. This is just how most architectures deal with that step. So thanks. Hope you learned a lot. If you didn't understand something, feel free to ask a question, or, you know, you have a comment or question or anything, get a hold of me, PM, comment, however you want to... You know, get a hold of me, I'm always here to help. And, uh, yeah, if you learned a lot and you want to learn more about CPU architecture, please subscribe or like the video, and I'll see you soon again. Bye.